This year's Royal Rumble saw one of the hottest free agents in professional wrestling embraced by the entire WWE universe with overwhelming support. That's right, the WrestleMania sign is back. Hello my fellow Marks and welcome to this year's Royal Rumble edition of the Mark Remark where I eliminate jokes every 90 seconds until I'm left with one that's halfway decent. My name's Martin and I'm still in the process of suing Adam Rose for stealing my extremely original React video format. This year's Royal Rumble is brought to us from Florida, America's penis. Speaking of penis, we go straight to the expert panel of cocks on the Cock Off Show. Renee Young, the host of Unfiltered, Booker T, the the host who should be filtered, Byron Saxton, who this time has been replaced by a pork roast with features, and Corey Graves, who is just grateful to be sat next to someone with charisma for once. Jerry Lawler has been promoted from the pay-per-view commentary team to the kickoff show panel, which is automatically funnier than 90% of his material. I am so excited to be here to impart my kingly knowledge and wisdom and experience. <laughs> Booker T forgets how to dress himself. Um, Booker, are you wearing your breakaway pants tonight? Uh oh, you know what? Always. Ah, not wearing any pants. Oh. Yes, it turns out that Booker T moonlights as a stripper, in that he's able to strip any given wrestling event of its credibility. Renee Young asks Booker how he used to mentally prepare for the Royal Rumble match, and he chooses instead to tell her about his strategy while playing Animal Crossing games. Talk about the butterflies being all over. My thing is, you just gotta make sure all those butterflies are in line. <laughs> And going the right way. Later in the night, Mr. Resetti shows up and yells at the timekeeper for resetting the clock every 90 seconds without saving. Corey Graves has an exciting announcement. For the first time ever, the Royal Rumble is available absolutely free to what? new subscribers. Unlike last year, where it was free to literally everyone after the gods of Valhalla were angered by Roman Reigns winning. Tom Phillips' school chum Rich Brennan is filling in for him in the social media lounge, as Tom got a fever and his mummy didn't want him getting out of bed. Rich Brennan shows that he has the vocal skills necessary for hosting the social media lounge segments. As we mentioned, the social outcasts, they will be here answering your questions, so all you have to do is get online, get on social media, and you Use the hashtag social outcast and they will be answering your questions a little bit later on. Curtis Axel, Bo Dallas, Heath Slater, and Adam Rose, they will be here answering your questions in just a bit. Just use that hashtag social outcast. It's very subtle, but the implication here is that the social outcast will be on the show later and you can ask them anything by using the hashtag social outcasts. Speaking of redundant things, these four scintillating teams will be taking place in a fatal four-way match for a spot in the Royal Rumble, including such well-established duos as Mark Henry and Jack Swagger, who are teaming up because America, and Damian Sandow and Darren Young, who are teaming up because... Uh, their names start with the letter D? Speaking of D, Booker T's average grade in high school. I gotta give the edge to the Dudley boys, making their long-awaited return to the Rumble. Ah yes, the Dudleys are indeed making their long-awaited return to the Rumble. We've not seen them in a Rumble match since last year, where Devon Dudley's urban camouflage proved so effective, he seemed invisible. The traditional Royal Rumble video package plays, where instead of focusing on the history of the match, they choose instead to focus on Roman Reigns' very important role in tonight's Rumble. Leading us to the biggest number of all for Roman Reigns, one. Funnily enough, that's also the biggest number for Booker, because that's as high as he can count. Yes, this year's Royal Rumble is literally all about Roman Reigns. But it's okay! Even though Roman was booed out of the building last year, in the last two weeks or so, people have sort of kind of started to like him a bit. So obviously it's a good idea to once again start jamming him down our throats until our gag reflexes just whimper and die like a puppy dying of asphyxiation. Speaking of suffocating animals, the noise that Jerry Lawler makes during this video footage of the League of Nations beating down Roman. Lesnar comes in manhandling the League of Nations. 
Things were breaking down. That's right. Last week on Raw, Barok Lesnar and Roman Reigns were involved in a shocking altercation. Shocking in the sense that it stunned everybody that Barok was actually physically interacting with another human being on television. The Wyatt family then showed up and dominated both Roman and Barok, leading to this expert insight from the experts on the expert panel of experts. When is the last time you saw Brock Lesnar just get beat down, manhandled? That would be never. Or four months ago. Renee asks the rest of the panel who they think will be the surprise entrance in the Rumble this year. And Booker T succinctly answers a completely different question. And the one thing about the young guys, they have nothing to lose. Everything to gain in a situation like this. Lay it all on the line. I want to see something happen tonight. Backstage, the League of Nations gang up on Roman Reigns once again. <laughs> yes! Yes! You stole my title! I'm going to, I'm going to the league! Oh wait, no, they're just taking it in turns to pound on a piece of wooden furniture. Have we learned nothing from the New Day Save the Tables movement? Booker T compares Kalisto to Alan Partridge. I call Kalisto going out there and having that, you know, aha moment. Let's hope that after losing the US title, Kalisto is finally able to bounce back. Jerry Lawler is on fire! And nobody wants to put him out. Let's face it, Kalisto is so short, his mask smells like feet. The last time Booker T, one of his predictions was right, Ric Flair had just been voted most promising newcomer. Booker T also tries his hand at the whole humor malarkey. Everything Kalisto has up his sleeve, though, is that Salida soul that we got, the OMG moments, the Slammy Award. He's got a lot going on. A lot of hot sauce. Oh, right, because he's Mexican. I get it, Booker. That's pleasantly racist. There's a promo for the upcoming episode of WWE 24 that focuses on WrestleMania 31, specifically Sting's first match in the WWE. It features unprecedented access to footage of Sting preparing for his match, and also shows us a rare glimpse of Triple H before putting on his artificial human host body. There is a video package for the Dean Ambrose vs. Kevin Owens feud, in which Dean Ambrose challenged Kevin Owens to a last man standing match. The joke on Dean, however, as the rules to the last man standing match specifically state that both competitors must be men, not cartoon chipmunks. Automatic disqualification. Should have challenged him to a last squirrel squatting match. Jojo interviews an extremely condescending Kevin Owens. Snark, Owens, snark! Snark, Owens, snark! Snark, Owens, snark! Out of all the experts, Booker T brings a lot to the table. A lot of packed lunch, I mean. He's a hungry guy. He brings nothing to the conversation. Why is he's that? He's terrifying. What? He's terrifying and he's mean. You just have to ask the right question. Yeah, Come it makes on. perfect sense. Come <laughs> on. I like Kevin Owens, man. Renee Young reveals that there is a secret third competitor in the last man standing match. Kevin Owens, Dean Ambrose, Le last man standing match. The experts do a great job of selling the fact that Dean Ambrose is a fighting champion. Dean Ambrose, a lunatic. This guy's brain is not only twisted, it's sprained. I mean, he doesn't even know when he's hurt. He's not going to know whether he should answer a 10 count or not. He doesn't have a clue what he's going to do next. Yes, nothing pushes Dean Ambrose as a strong competitor like saying he's thick as a fucking plank. And clearly Dean doesn't know what he's doing half the time. That's how he won the Intercontinental title in a sequence of wrestling moves that resulted in him winning the match. That's how he outsmarted all the other wrestlers. By being dumb. Booker T is asked for his opinion on the match's potential outcome, but he is too distracted by the crowd chanting for AJ Styles to give his typically straightforward insight. It's gonna be his type of match tonight. Listen to the yes, people. Can you hear the this? people are rumbling. Rumble, young man, rumble. Yes. That's what Dean Ambrose is gonna do tonight. Well, that clears that up. Michael Cole, JBL, and Byron Saxton are here to do what they do best. Accurately describe what's happening in a wrestling ring. Easy one to start with. All they need to do is tell us that Eden Styles is about to announce the first match. Hey, we have a very important match now that will affect the Royal Rumble match. Let's head up to Lillian Garcia. Oh, well, anybody could have made that mistake. Lillian Garcia and Eden Styles are practically identical. Identical. It turns out that one versus all refers to Michael Cole versus all the common sense in the known world. Erect sponge cake Mark Henry and Jack Swagger carpooled to the show tonight, so now they're a formidable tag team or something. Darren Young tries to get his partner Damian Sandow to do the millions of dollars dance, but much like Vince McMahon with the million dollar potential of the Miz versus Mizdow feud, he gives up on it almost immediately. The fatal four-way gets underway, 
and the crowd is firmly behind the team of Darren Young and Damian Sandow. Or as most of the crowd refers to them, the team of Damian Sandow. Byron Sexton lends his view on the team of D&D. Partnership between Darren Young and Sandow. Look, they're not necessarily uh, an accomplished team, but hey, strange opportunities, great. Partnerships. Yes, having a chance to be in the Royal Rumble is a very strange opportunity. What a wacky and zany chance they have to win the WWE title. David effing Lynch may as well have directed this part of the show because it's so surreal. All four teams rush into the middle of the ring and have a mild disagreement, so we cut to a commercial before the non-tension can get too out of hand. There is a promo featuring a number of upcoming WWE Network exclusives, such as Ride Along 3, the Ridening, a commercial for the Broken Skull Challenge, a thing Zack Ryder should probably be doing instead of two retired men, and a rejected adult swim pilot. Eva Marie has switched from demeaning wrestling in general to demeaning just one specific pay-per-view. Even the commercials can't drown out the support for Damien Sandow. WWE. We return to the match where Jack Swagger and Connor of the Ascension are in the middle of a wrestling sequence and the announced team realize that it's been a whole two seconds since the WWE Network was plugged so they do that instead of describing the sequence. The crowd chants sexual chocolate at Mark Henry who responds by swaying his hips lending even more credibility to this very important match. But as we all know strange opportunities create strange pelvic gyrations. Mark Henry and Jack Swagger pick up the win, ensuring themselves a spot in the Royal Rumble. Of course, in the Royal Rumble match, there are no friends, only enemies, which promises to drive a huge wedge into this relationship, which has lasted at least since tea time this afternoon. Renee passes us over to the social media lounge, where the social outcasts successfully bully Rich Brennan into leaving and letting them take over. Rich Brennan then goes and eggs the social outcasts' house, with the help of his friend Tom Phillips, causing them both to be grounded for a month. The Royal Rumble is sponsored by Chex Mix. Chex Mix, we hope you like pretzels, because that's mostly what you'll be getting. There is a retrospective on the Becky Lynch versus Charlotte feud, and we are reminded that Becky got Charlotte's father into giving her a title shot. Rick, you never back down from a challenge. You know, except for the fact that begging off comprised about 99% of Ric Flair's career. Booker T versus Technology is the most consistently entertaining feud in the last five years. This is my shucky ducky quack quack oh, no. moment yes! of the night. Give us that shucky Where's ducky. Where's my graphic? Where's it? <laughs> the experts hype up the Royal Rumble match, or as it has been so expertly hashtagged, the one versus all match. You know, because this year it's all about one person versus everybody else in the match as opposed to all the other Royal Rumbles, which have apparently been team efforts. Hashtag some versus some others. Hashtag a bunch versus the rest. Somehow the CGI Roman Reigns statue manages to outact the actual CGI Roman Reigns. I only assume that he's CGI. I mean, it would explain why he's the Jar Jar of the WWE. Misa gonna Superman punch you now, okie day? And you say can be re that. Renee Young gives the other experts 10 seconds to state their picks for the Royal Rumble winner this year. Corey Graves picks Barack Lesnar, causing Booker T to call him out. You're a coattail rider. You're a bandwagon jumper. Wow. You're always trying to pick the guy that you think should be the guy. Yeah, stop trying to pick the guy who should be the guy in the segment specifically devoted to that. Besides, we all know that Kofi Kingston is the guy who was picked to be the guy, guy. Jerry Lawler promotes how important Important and valuable this upcoming pay-per-view is going to be. If you're planning on paying for the Royal Rumble right now through your cable company, you're an idiot. Well, now I'm sold. The Royal Rumble pay-per-view begins with Vince and Stephanie being interviewed by JoJo, who is so short that Vince has to physically lower himself to look at her. Fortunately for Vince, he's had plenty of practice doing this every week when he looks at the flowchart for Raw's ratings. Somebody replaces the introduction video for the Royal Rumble with a commercial for a shitty wrestling game for the game. GameCube. There is a reckoning coming. And the announcers verbally climax over the sheer number of odds that Roman Reigns will have to overcome tonight. Never before in the history of WWE has its champion faced such odds. The odds are astronomical. Michael Cole is a lot like C-3PO. He loves to tell us the odds and he's fluent in over six million forms of hyperbole. Let the Royal Rumble begin. One. Versus all.
Again, as opposed to the previous Royal Rumbles, which were all about dividing everybody into friendly teams of 15. Big E's crotch is one of the many odds that Roman needs to overcome. The first match of the pay-per-view is the last man standing match for the Intercontinental title, or in the parlance of tonight's event, a one versus one match. Star of Alvin and the Chipmunks 4, the road chip, Dean Ambrose is the champion. So of course he comes out first because he's an insane lunatic whose manic madness prevents him from following tradition. He also doesn't wear green on St. Patrick's Day. What a lunatic! While Kevin Owens arrives in the Snarkmobile, Michael Cole introduces us to all the foreign announced teams, including French, Spanish, and whatever gibberish JBL is spewing most of the time. Owens and Ambrose brawl outside the ring, and Ambrose throws Kevin Owens into Michael Cole while he's in the middle of calling the action, taking him out and destroying his hive mind link with Byron and JBL, who simply open their mouths and scream while their brains emit loud, unrelenting static. Dean Ambrose picks up a gaffy stick, and then Michael Cole reenacts one of those old G.I. Joe PSA cartoons from the internet. Go ahead, hit it, Dean! Get him with a stick! Byron thinks that Dean Ambrose belongs in the happiest asylum on Earth. This is like going to Disney World for Ambrose, all these toys at his disposal. I personally don't see that much of a link between Disney World and the WWE. After all, one of them is just a rowdy carnival filled with outlandish cartoon characters created by an eccentric mastermind, and the other one is Disney World. Kevin Owens cannonballs Dean into the barricade, and unlike the glass ceiling, it gives way for them. Kevin swings the Nerf rebel bat at Dean Ambrose, and JBL hints at Dean's former identity as the Titty Master. Little tit for tat. And then the announcers attempt to spoil a movie that none of them have actually seen. Yeah. It's kind of a symbol of air. Grizzly bear. Yeah, and you saw what happened in Revenant, didn't you? Well. Bear one. Ah yes, that bear attack early in the movie. Despite what you might believe having seen it, the bear actually wins and kills DiCaprio's character. That explains why there's another 90 minutes of film after that where the bear just goes home and tends to its young. It's a huge plot twist. It turns out it's just a nature documentary. This also explains why Dean will never win the WWE Championship. He's the WWE's DiCaprio. Both men retrieve a number of weapons from under the ring and Byron remarks on the legality of using them. He said anything at their disposal, anything you can utilize to keep your opponent down for that 10 count. You're right, Byron. The only thing that limits you is your imagination. Yes, the only limit is your imagination. So long as your imagination adheres to the very strict PG-13 rules of the WWE brand. So stop imagining actual violence. That would be silly. None of that. Kevin Owens refuses to be goaded by fans at ringside. Byron, the only thing that limits you is your imagination. Come on, Yes, it's like looking into a tattoo of a mirror. In other news, animals of the same species tend to look similar. WWE fans everywhere are shocked. A chair catches on Kevin Owens' head and he has to stumble around the ring like a plonker until it falls off. Meanwhile, backstage, Vince McMahon is impressed by the chair's ability to grab the brass ring and gives it its own intercontinental title reign. This marks the first time an inanimate object has held the intercontinental title since the big show in 2012. Both men hit each other with devastating offense that could leave either man out cold for the 10 count. Dean is hanging in there and giving it all he's got. So of course Michael Cole takes this opportunity to remind us that Dean hasn't got a fucking clue what he's doing. Dean Ambrose just makes his stuff up as he goes along. I think he has no game plan whatsoever. Our intercontinental champion. Lol, he's so random. Kevin Owens and Dean Ambrose take a break from the match to quote the incredible dialogue from the Revenge of the Sith lightsaber duel between Obi-Wan and Anakin. I hate you! Oh, I hate you! The match ends when Dean Ambrose throws Kevin Owens through two tables. So of course we know who won. Bear won. Yes. Yeah, Good job, Bear. Xavier Woods opens his email account after stating that Bloodborne was the worst game of 2015. Team Championship. And then a member of the WWE Universe tries using Horn of the Unicorn to raise the New Day's attack and defense points. Sadly, they forgot that Vince McMahon always has a spare negate attack card ready for whenever the WWE fans try to influence the product. Also, you can't activate that card from the graveyard. And trust me, the WWE fandom is the graveyard. The New Day defend their tag titles against the Usos, who are very upset that the internet has chosen to post photoshopped pornographic images of them.
The announcers spend more time applying ridiculous made-up names to the members of the New Day than actually using the names of the moves that they're using in the match. Who's Rudy, Tootie, and Booty in the New Day? Byron. I believe uh, Rudy is Kofi, Tootie is Xavier, and of course, Booty is Big E. As opposed to the announced team, who are Pity, Titty, and Shitty. The New Day successfully defend their titles and celebrate in the middle of the ring by making love to John Cena. Fortunately, we can't see him. Michael Cole theorizes that we might see the WWE crossover with Pixar in the near future. Strowman and Harper and Eric Rowan work for the cause tonight, and the cause is Bray Wyatt. Who's that cutting a scary promo backstage? We are war. We are pestilence. We are famine. We are death. Yes, it's the Four Horsemen, not to be confused with the Four Horsemen, or the Four Horsemen, or Bojack Horsemen. The Wyatts announce their intention to dominate the Royal Rumble and bring about the end of the world. Just like in the Book of Revelation, where it states that should 29 other men be thrown over yonder top rope and their feet toucheth the ground, then the seventh seal shall be opened and the world will be cast into hellfire and brimstone. They didn't call it no chance in hell for nothing. Up next, Alberto Del Rio defends his US Championship against Kalisto. And since Del Rio is the champion, he comes out first! I mean, that makes sense, what with Del Rio being from Mexico. They're not known for following wrestling tradition in bloody Mexico. It's just a bit of a laugh for them. Wrestling? Pfft. They just wear silly masks and just faff about. So yeah, Del Rio comes out first, because why not? Next out comes Kalisto, and Michael Cole helpfully explains that Lucha is Spanish for fight. He also explains that Hulu is Spanish for endless amounts of commercials. Cole compares this feud to the classic tale of David versus Goliath. Yeah, but this isn't the Valley of Elah, this isn't a fairy tale. Right. That old fairy tale known as the Bible, where Jesus narrowly escaped being pinned to a crucifix when all his woodland friends came out to save him. Michael Cole reminds us that Kalisto won the Slammy Award for OMG Moment of the Year. He also reminds us that OMG Moment of the Year was an award that somebody actually got paid to come up with. This year, the Slammies will just be an indecipherable string of emojis. Well, I personally hope that they nominate Braun Strowman for monkey covering his iziest wrestler of the year. Del Rio shamefully tries to remove Kalisto's mask, which is the only thing preventing him from transforming back into lovable goof Stanley Ipkiss. Del Rio then threatens to unmask the WrestleMania sign. No! Everyone will know its secret identity. It's really just the Starcade sign in disguise. Del Rio has a latent hatred of ring ropes and wants everyone to beat them up. Del Rio throws Kalisto off the top rope with hellacious force, and Michael Cole describes the move with the subtlety of a Nickelodeon game show host. Oh no, that's it! Splat! Even the announcers acknowledge how redundant their own roles are. Del Rio is out here tonight to make a point. Oh, he's making that point all right. That's what he came out here for, I just said that, Byron. Kalisto demonstrates that he has learned well from his master, Sin Cara, and botches a move in spectacular fashion. What the heck was that? Something Kalisto went for, but missed. That's why you call it high risk. I could have sworn high risk referred to extreme levels of danger, not extreme levels of looking like a fanny. Del Rio reenacts everyone's least favorite episode of Breaking Bad. Del Rio's having a hard time putting that mosquito away. Kalisto pulls off the upset and gets the win, and JBL reveals himself to be the anti-Donald Trump. At least Del Rio can never go back to Mexico. Back at Experts Anonymous, Corey Graves gives Dean Ambrose the literal props that he deserves. He's still gotta get in the Royal Rumble match tonight. You better get out the duct tape and, and super glue. I mean, I don't know. Sorry, Dean. Turns out Vince used up all the super glue and duct tape fixing Roman Reigns' push. Backstage, one of the brightest creative minds in wrestling and Stephanie McMahon are having a conversation. Paul Heyman wishes to renegotiate Barack Lesnar's contract once he dominates at the Royal Rumble. See, Barack wants to streamline his busy schedule, and instead of doing fuck all all year, he wants to instead upgrade to doing shit all. The announcers hype up 
Fastlane and remind us that last year, Fastlane decided who would go to WrestleMania for a shot at the title. You know, the thing that the Royal Rumble is supposed to do. This thing. Here. The thing you're watching. That thing. The most important stop on the road to WrestleMania, Fastlane. Ah, yes. The Fastlane is an important stop. That's why it's called the Fastlane. Because you stop there. At least you do if you're the lunatic fringe Dean Ambrose. He never passed his driving test. He's a wild man! CGI Roman statue Charlotte is overshadowed by her CGI Roman statue father, CGI Roman statue Ric Flair. Contrary to the rest of the pay-per-view, the challenger for the Divas title comes out first. Sadly, it turns out this was merely to allow time for Ric Flair to finish paying his bar tab and make his way to the arena. The arrogant champion Charlotte makes her way to the ring and the WWE establishes her character in the most effective way possible via social media. And if you want to know how Charlotte's attitude has changed, all you gotta do is read the tweet she sent out earlier today. Wouldn't really have worked back in the day, would it? Man, that Andre the Giant sure hates Hulk Hogan, and if you don't believe us, you should read what he wrote in his diary. It's all in French. And... With the Divas Revolution in full effect, nobody leaves to take a piss break during this match. Even Ric Flair. He still takes a piss break, he just does it at ringside, unbeknownst to anybody else. Becky Lynch is sexually assaulted by Ric Flair right in front of the referee, but he allows it because they're secretly his OTP. His one true flaring, you might say. Michael Cole successfully completes his transformation into a Looney Tunes character. Oh, no, 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 no. What? Are you kidding me? JBL justifies Ric Flair's molestation of a woman. I mean, how long has Ric Flair been saying he's a kiss stealing? And you guys are surprised that he stole a kiss? Yeah, good point. I mean, if Ric Flair flew a jet into the arena, that wouldn't be surprising either. Because he's been telling us for years that he's a jet flying, limousine riding, etc, etc. It would just be a mediocre segment at best. JBL compares Charlotte to Alundra Blaze. The key difference being that Charlotte pulled the Divas title out of the garbage, as opposed to putting it in there. Becky Lynch gets Charlotte in the disarmer submission, but she is foiled by the cunning mind of Ric Flair, who employs the strategy of lobbing a jacket at her. This also doesn't get Charlotte disqualified because the referee thought Becky looked a bit chilly anyway. Becky reacts to the jacket as if she's being attacked by a giant octopus on the set of an Ed Wood movie, and Michael Cole has no idea what just happened. Couldn't quite make, make out what happened in the middle of that sequence. We know that the nature boy threw the, uh, his sport jacket at Becky forcing Becky to come out of submission. Yes, he couldn't quite make it out, but that didn't prevent him from describing exactly what happened. Every baffling detail. Charlotte spears Becky and retains her Divas title, and then Sasha Banks emerges and takes out both Charlotte and Becky in one fell swoop. There is still no word as to why Vince randomly decided to finally push Sasha. Perhaps it was the crowd chanting, we want Sasha for the last eight months. Or maybe it was the more likely story of Vince hearing all the potential Oscar buzz for the movie movie The Big Short and deciding they needed more material that revolved around Banks. The WWE tricked their fans into thinking they were taking part in some dull focus group. And just when you thought it couldn't get more boring, here comes The Big Show. To make it less boring, I mean. Turns out Chex Mix and the WWE teamed up to give their fans a big surprise. Being drafted into NXT to compensate for WWE's mostly injured roster. The Royal Rumble is about to begin, so we go to Lillian Garcia, who is by now an expert at explaining the rules of the match. Every 90 seconds, another superstar will join in. This will continue until all 30 participants are joined the match. Yes, and once they are joined, all their memories and experiences will become one with the WrestleMania sign. It's an ancient trill tradition going down centuries. The first entrant is Roman Reigns, and the entire arena boos the piss out of him. Or as Michael Cole explains... Very mixed reaction for Roman Reigns as he comes into the Amway Center here tonight. Yes, a very mixed reaction. As in the boos are being mixed with other boos. Similarly, Michael Cole made a mixtape for his high school crush that was just the same song repeated 20 times. Byron Saxton don't need no education. In the words of Pink Floyd, right now, Roman Reigns has to make himself comfortably numb to the monumental challenge that 
what lies ahead. You know, if you play Dark Side of the Moon while watching the Royal Rumble, you'll notice it doesn't sync up at all. It does, however, provide a great way of drowning out the announcers. The second entrant is Rusev, accompanied by Lana, who should have probably been entered into the match in Rusev's place. After all, if she's half as good at throwing people over the top rope as she is at throwing her husband under the bus, she'd be a shoe in to win. Michael Cole points out that both men have dominated in the Rumble match. In Roman Reigns' first Rumble, he set a record by eliminating 12 men. Who will eliminate? Here tonight at the Royal Rumble match. Presumably whoever are joined the match will eliminate in the Royal Rumble. I feel like we're missing some words. Roman hits Rusev with the spear and eliminates him, but the fans still boo. Roman responds to this by stomping around the ring and screaming, I am the champion. And the fans are like, whoa, sorry, mate. Didn't realize you were the champion. We'll rescind all those boos and start cheering you instead. Whoops. <laughs> they just keep booing him. Number three is AJ Styles. The crowd goes apeshit. Everyone is super excited. Everything about this debut is perfectly captured. Such an emotional moment for AJ and wrestling fans alike. Surely we will all look back on this footage and marvel at how the WWE did an amazing job of presenting AJ Styles to the world. Brilliant! Roman Reigns hits a Samoan drop on AJ Styles and the crowd has a very mixed reaction. As in it's a mixture of boos and hisses this time. Entrant number four is Alistair from Dragon Age, who is eliminated faster than you can lick a lamppost in winter. Number five is... <laughs> <laughs> hey. Number six is Chris Jericho, and the announcers remind us that this match is truly every man for himself. It is Y2J, Chris Jericho. No Roman, the road does not get any easier. And by every man for himself, I guess I meant every man for Roman Reigns. Because from what I'm now gathering, he is literally the only person in the Rumble worth talking about. Or looking at. Or thinking about. Chris Jericho faces off against Roman Reigns and AJ Styles, and then flows seamlessly from his trademark offense into a promotional spot for the Uber app. Entrant number seven is the businessman Kane, who means demon. Sorry, I mean the demon man Kane, who means business. Number eight is Goldust, who successfully hits AJ Styles with a move so devastating it causes the cameraman to cut to whatever the fuck Roman Reigns is doing at that point. So we missed the move altogether. Good job. Entrant number nine is Ryback, who receives a genuine mixed reaction. That's right, some folks are simply booing and some folk are cheering slightly because they thought Goldberg just debuted. Other people are booing because of that as well. Every new year, Ryback creates a vision board of his goals. The number one thing on that list this year, become WWE World Heavyweight Champion. And the number two goal is to find out why everybody keeps laughing when he mentions he has a vision board. AJ Styles tries to eliminate Roman and the crowd starts chanting yes. I mean, uh, they're actually chanting guess. As in they're trying to guess who the next entrant will be. Yes, that's what they're doing, yes. One versus all, guys, yeah. Entrant 10 is Kofi Kingston, whose original gimmick revolved around him liking reggae music, which will come in handy tonight because after hearing all the boos for the WWE Champion, he'll be able to bust out a verse of no Roman, no cry. Titus O'Neil lightly shoves his way to the ring at number 11, and it looks like he's going to be suspended. Uh, over the top rope at some point in the match. And this is a big night for Titus. He just won a Father's Incorporated Spirit Award. And now Titus O'Neil with a shoulder tackle. Yes, what a huge occasion for Titus. He won an award and did a shoulder tackle. Mark that in your calendar, folks. Titus eliminates Goldust. Ironically, both men will soon be very familiar with the phrase shattered dreams. Number 12 is R-Truth, who has hilariously forgotten how you're supposed to win the Royal Rumble. Much like the creative team who have forgotten how to book the Royal Rumble. Kane eliminates R-Truth and then throws the ladder over the top rope as well, eliminating that. Ironically, that was Glenn Jacobs' ladder. Kofi Kingston avoids elimination by landing on top of Big E's shoulders. Sadly, this spot was actually a huge botch as Kofi was supposed to land precariously on top of Big E's crotch bulge and then walk it like a tightrope. Not sure how he missed such a sizable target. 
Speaking of unsightly bulges, number 13 is the cloud of body odor known as Luke Harper. Michael Cole notes how appropriate it is that Luke Harper come out at 13, presumably because that's the number of baths he's had in his adult life. The League of Calamitous Intent run to the ring and start beating the piss out of Roman, leaving the audience in stunned silence. Oh, my mistake, sorry, that's just regular silence because of how predictable this all is. Number 14 is Stardust, but never mind that young man's potential to win the WWE Championship. Things are happening to Roman and must be documented in unyielding detail. It's, it's kind of hard to pay attention to this match with this massacre that just happened outside the ring. Well, that explains this one, but why aren't you able to pay attention to all the other matches? Number 15 is... Oh great, the production team forgot to play my audio clip of Jerry Lawler saying the big show. Where's it? Et tu Booker. The EMTs try putting Roman onto a stretcher, but he's determined to walk out of the arena with his head held high. Um, Roman, you're still in the rumble, remember? One versus all? That thing? Oh, that's right, I forgot. Walking out of a match that you're still participating in while you're able to is the manliest thing a person can do. Number 16 is... Nowadays, everybody want to talk like the gods something to say, but nothing comes out when they move the lips. Just a bunch of gibberish and gravity acts like I forgot about Neville. The announcers really know how to draw your attention to Neville's undeniable talent. Look at Neville go. This is Neville's very first Royal Rumble match, and now look at Roman Reigns. Forget the man that gravity forgot. Kofi is the man that the camera crew forgot because they literally forgot to show him being eliminated. Entrance 17 is Powdered Toast Man, who eliminates Kane and then goes straight to face off with the Big Show. And in the background, this poop emoji perfectly represents their potential feud. Strowman manages to put Big Show to sleep and eliminates him single-handed. So now Big Show finally knows what it's like to be put to sleep by one of his matches. Number 18 is Team Four Star's Limpy Pator, who immediately eliminates AJ Styles. AJ's face shows just how devastated he is at losing his shot at the title. But don't count AJ out yet. I hear the WWE just signed his good friend, Shinsuke Nakamura. Together, they will be an unstoppable force. Number 19 is the lunatic Pandora, Dean Ambrose. And meanwhile, the crowd gives AJ Styles a standing ovation, which the WWE choose not to show and instead replay the footage of the League of Nations beating up Roman. You know, the thing the crowd didn't have a reaction to. Entrance number Number 20 is Sami Zayn, leader of the Ginger Uprising. Sami Zayn is finally able to get one up on Kevin Owens and eliminates him, leaving NXT fans extremely satisfied and WWE fans asking, why did Seth Rogen just beat up the bear from The Revenant? Number 21 is Eric Rowan, who was supposed to come out at number 4, but he needed another 15 minutes to finish cutting a three-word promo. 22 is Virile Cadbury's Cream Egg, Mark Henry, who was immediately eliminated by the combined stank of the Wyatt family. It turns out that the B at number 23 stands for Barack Lesnar. Braun Strowman chooses willingly to sign his own death warrant and no sell some of Barack's offense. Letters for the bereaved can be sent to Sister Abigail's home for the mentally unstable. Number 24 is Jack Spicer, who is immediately taken out of the match by Barack Lesnar. Hopefully this doesn't damage the foundations of the close-knit relationship formed by Mark Henry and Jack Swagger while standing in line for a sandwich earlier that day. Number 25 is The Miz, who chooses to avoid using his offensive wrestling moves and instead use his offensive wrestling commentary. Keeps looking at me like that, I'll turn Tuplex City into Misty World. I'm more a fan of the Mizarding world of Harry Potter. 26 is Alberto Del Rio. Number 27 is Bray Wyatt, who conducts a vicious assault on Barok Lesnar with the rest of the Wyatt family, eliminating the former UFC champion. As you would expect from someone with Lesnar's legendary temper, he calmly walks away having accepted what just happened. Turns out UFC C stands for Understanding Friendly Citizen. Dolph Ziggler enters at number 28, and JBL points out that Batista has won the Royal Rumble twice from entering at this position. However, Dolph Ziggler has to deal with the crippling handicap of being Dolph Ziggler. The Miz tries to break Dolph Ziggler's chances of winning the Rumble match, but only succeeds in breaking Michael Cole's voice. Miz! Trying to eliminate Dolph Ziggler, didn't happen. Entering at number 29 is the obnoxious Celtic Guardian Sheamus, followed closely by the just plain obnoxious Roman Reigns. Roman does an incredible job of selling the damage done to him earlier in the night by sprinting to the ring and laying out everybody else in the match like nothing happened. To everyone's non-surprise, at number 30, it's Triple H. Perhaps one of the biggest heels in wrestling history and the only man in the last two years to be able to get the crowd to chant why 
badly for Roman. So of course when he faces Roman this time, people are chanting his name and begging him to win. Turns out one versus all was a typo, and the Rumble's gimmick was actually supposed to be one versus Paul. We have not seen Triple H since Roman Reigns sent him to the hospital over a month ago. Yes, he's definitely been in the hospital and definitely wasn't shown to be in full health the next week at the NXT TakeOver special. Turns out that was just a mass hallucination. Much like the mass hallucination we're experiencing right now, where it seems that a trombone is more over than the WWE Champion. Roman Reigns hits the Superman punch on Triple H. Let's find out which is louder, the sound of this pin dropping or the crowd's reaction. Great performance, Superman punch! Roman successfully eliminates Sheamus, and then Triple H takes advantage of this and eliminates Roman. As you can imagine, the top heel eliminating the top babyface in the company has exactly the reaction you would expect. The biggest cheer of the night. Roman Reigns eliminated! Oh my gosh. Michael Cole somehow makes Dean Ambrose's fake out clothesline even less credible. Wacky line! No, Michael, now you're just reading the script directions. You're supposed to just say a wacky line, not just say wacky... Never mind. The crowd is firmly behind Dean and believe that he can take down Triple H and win the WWE title. Meanwhile, Michael Cole is excited that he can stream the new Jack Black movie on his iPad. What a moment! I got goosebumps out here! Dean Ambrose is now left alone in the ring to face off against one of the biggest challenges of his entire career. But don't worry, Roman Reigns won't just stand idly by and watch his friend be eliminated. No, instead he's going to sit idly by and watch his friend be eliminated. Triple H proves what a heel he is by refusing to point at the WrestleMania sign while he celebrates. And then Byron Saxton leaves us with some food for thought. Guys, uh, here's a cryptic quote that the authority has made famous. They always say, in the end, the authority wins. Yes, that's the most cryptic quote I think I've ever heard. Move over the Sphinx. The authority are here to bamboozle your brain by saying that they're going to win. Thanks for joining me for yet another peek through the glory hole that is wrestling. And remember, Triple H may have won the match, but we know who won the night. Bear. Bear won.